Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. I want to thank uh, Brother Kennedy for the song selection this morning. The last song we just sing ties in perfectly with the things that we want to talk about this morning. I love when the songs uh, connect in that way and when the song leader takes the effort to try and connect messages that way. Um, the Bible often presents its reader with a dichotomous choice. A dichotomous choice is one where you have only two options. There's a decision to be made, and you can choose option A, or you can choose option B, and the point is that options A and options B have no overlap. They are mutually exclusive in effect. Option B is not option A, you might say. And this comes up often in the Bible. For example, uh, who do you serve? You can serve God or wealth. For example, Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You can't serve God and wealth. So a choice has to be made sometimes. Might I pursue wealth, prioritize wealth to get me through some difficult time? Is that going to be the way that I'm going to live my life? Or will I choose to serve God, uh, to live my life according to God's principles and his counsel? Another one, will we befriend God or will we befriend the world? James chapter 4, verse 4 starts out, uh, Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The way the world approaches life and its philosophy and its decision-making is, uh, stands in stark opposition to God's principles. And so a choice has to be made. Will I reason and will I use logic that is consistent with worldly standards uh, or that happens to be consistent with the cultural norms of the time because those change from generation to generation? Or will I operate and make decisions consistent with uh, the teachings of the Bible, God's Word which has been revealed to us? Another one, do we seek to please God or do we seek to please people? Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul says, For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? And you see the dichotomy. It's one or the other. Am I striving to please men? If I were striving to please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. So Paul presents a choice with two options, to seek the favor of men or of God, to seek to please men, or to be a servant of Christ. And the point is that those are in opposition to each other. For Paul, to seek to please men was incompatible with being a bondservant of Christ. You either serve Christ, uh, which means to live a life consistent with the teachings of Jesus, or you seek to please people, even if that means sacrificing the truth, uh, or doing what we know to be at odds with what the Bible teaches, or even endorsing it. So the Bible presents several seemingly dichotomous choices, uh, but really these all boil down to one, the dichotomous choice. God or something else? Really, all of these boil down to that one conclusion. And so the question is, who do we serve? Who do you serve? It's God, or if you ignore God, there's going to be a void, and you will fill that void with something else, be it money, uh, be it you know, the worldly standards, people to seek uh, a, a certain reputation amongst people. It's God or something else. Now, I want us to recognize briefly that these choices are difficult. It's not easy. The Bible spends much time talking about this, these choices that have to be made. Um, and you know the fact that it goes to that so often is, should be a warning sign to us to look out for it because we're susceptible to it. And what I want to suggest is that it's not hard because we don't know the answer. Right? Sometimes you're presented with a question. I'm sure all of us could raise our hand and think of a time when we took a test in school or something, and you're presented with a question and you don't know the answer. Right? Because it's a hard question. That's what we think of when we think of a difficult choice to be made. This is not hard because we don't know the answer. All of us here know the answer. I don't have to convince you that we ought to choose God over other standards over other ways of living our life, we know the answer. But it's still hard because it turns out that circling that answer to circle God means to behave a certain way. It means to change your life. And for that reason, it's difficult. Not because we don't know the answer. Uh, sometimes it's difficult because it requires us to go against mainstream thinking. 
to choose a path that is unpopular, that's at odds with people. It puts us in the minority, and for that reason, it influences us perhaps in a negative way, and it makes it hard to choose. And so, to that end, this morning, I want to consider an example of choosing service to God despite it being in the minority uh, or being unpopular. And for that, we'll look at the example of Joshua. A familiar quote, you know, if you were to think a quotation of Joshua that's most popular, it would be the one that we read in our scripture reading this morning from Joshua chapter 24, verse 15. Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. He goes on to contrast God of Israel versus the gods of the other nations. And Joshua gives his conclusion, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This choice is not exclusive to Joshua. It's one that all of us will have to make and do make every day. And this line comes from Joshua chapter 24 at the very end of his life. Uh, It's actually in chapter 23 and chapter 24 of Joshua are two sort of end of life speeches where Joshua has an opportunity to address Israel, the people, and the leaders, the elders, it says, one last time. He's got one opportunity to tell them some things before he goes the way of all the earth, and here's what he has to tell them. Um, The lesson this morning is to get into the mind of Joshua. What can we gather from the things that he had to say prior to that famous quotation in Joshua 24.15? What did he say? What was the meat of his message? And what can we gather from that gave him his strength? Where did he anchor his faith? The idea is, let's try this morning to identify some resources, some tools that Joshua apparently relied on to encourage himself to make this choice. And then consider for ourselves, do we have access to the same resources? Do we have access to the same tools that Joshua used to anchor his faith? And so we'll look at some of his final words that's recorded for us in the book of Joshua. As with all my lessons, I want to give you the answer uh, front and center so that you can look for it to make it impossible to leave this morning without understanding where I'm trying to take this. Here's the short answer. He remembered what God had done for him. He constantly called... This is important. You know, as plain and simple as that seems, that's the take-home message. He continually called to memory what God had done for him, the power and the might of God that he witnessed himself, that he had read about God doing, the promise that he had read about God giving to Abraham and things like this. He constantly called them to memory and he remembered God has proven himself to be faithful. This God that we worship, this almighty and powerful God, which has done things that couldn't be done unless he really were God. He constantly called himself to those memories. He, He seemed to center his mind on that continually, and that's where he gathered his strength and his encouragement. And hopefully at this point we'll be clear from the text this morning. All right, so we'll start in Joshua chapter 23. The first of... Uh, the two end-of-life addresses that he gives. So if you've got your Bible, I'm not going to display the verses on the screen here, uh, but we're, we're going to read it this morning. So follow along with me, if you will, in Joshua chapter 3. We'll start in verse 1. It says, It came about after many days when the Lord had given rest to Israel from all their enemies on every side, and Joshua was old and advanced in years. Joshua called, so he's old and advanced. That's sort of a phraseology that's used for people when they're about to give like a deathbed speech. And it says in verse 2, He called for all Israel, for their elders, their heads, their judges, their officers, and said to them, I'm old and advanced in years. He calls together all these people, leaders, common people. He's got one last opportunity to address them and to encourage them. He's been their leader for the majority of the conquest of Canaan now, and he's about to die and he wants to encourage them one last time, he's going to start his speech in verse 3. And I want you to notice where he starts. Consider yourself. Where would you go? Where would you start if you had one last opportunity? This lesson that I'm giving used to be a part of a larger lesson called Last Words, where I would survey different people and the things they had to say right before they died. Examples in Jacob and Joshua and Moses, the entire book of Deuteronomy. Um... And consider, you know, there's some common themes. And so one of the common themes is consistent with the way 
Joshua starts his speech. Notice where he begins in verse 3. You have seen all that the Lord your God has done to all these nations because of you. For the Lord your God is he who has been fighting for you. And what I want to point out is that at the start of his speech, he calls them to remember. Consider all the things that you have seen. Israel, look where you are. Do you understand where you are? You're in Canaan. You're in the promised land. For generations, your ancestors looked to this very point. And you're here. Can you believe it? All the things that God promised would come to fruition are now here. He has been there to deliver you against the peoples of the land as we have come into conquest. For Joshua, that was where he anchored his faith. How awesome is that? Joshua kept these things in memory. God made a promise. He's delivered on the promise. He is faithful, so I'll be faithful. Um, he goes on in verses 4 and 5 to talk about there's still some more land to be taken here, and God will be with you in that conquest. Consider in verse 6, he's going to make a conclusionary statement. He will say, be very firm then, in verse 6. Then, as if to say, therefore, based on the things that I've just pointed out to you, Notice how God has been faithful. Because of that, be firm to keep and do all that is written in the book of the law of Moses so that you may not turn aside from it to the right hand or to the left so that you will not associate with these nations, these which remain among you, or mention the name of their gods or make anyone swear by them or serve them or bow down to them. Joshua's made his decision. He's encouraging them to make the same decision. And his point, the support for his conclusion is based on Remember what God did. Look at where you are and don't forget. He discourages them from going after the other gods of the lands. I want to pause here and think about when we read these accounts, you know, about worshiping Baal or Bel, the god in Babylon, or Molech or the Ashtoreth. When you think about that, you know, sometimes I feel disconnected from that because. They're, 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 as far as I know, there's no surrounding peoples who are sacrificing their children to Baal, for example. Like, I don't feel tempted to do that, okay? So how does this become relevant? Really, when you think about what the gods of the other nations were, is they were replacing what God Almighty, the God, was supposed to fill. God was your answer for everything. If you were struggling because there was no rain, they would go to the God of rain and make a sacrifice. You know, if you lost a loved one and you're struggling with something, they would pray to their God for comfort or whatever. They were taking, they had removed God from their lives and they were filling that void with something else. And that point, that principle, is something that is relevant to us. Because, you know, the way that the world deals with problems might be to pursue wealth, to pursue money at any and all costs. Drugs, or sex, or pride. Those are the gods of the lands today. Don't pursue those things to fill a void which God should fill. Joshua's counsel is relevant for us as well. Pursue God, stay faithful, and do this by remembering what He has done. Continue in verse 8. He said, But you are to cling to the Lord your God as you have done this day. For the Lord has... Well, he says, Cling to God, stay close to God, for Joshua, this is where he went, and now he's going to tell you why to do that. Because remember, verse 9, For the Lord has driven out great and strong nations from before you. As for you, no man uh, has stood before you to this day. I'm trying to point out the logic that he's using. He makes a point, and then he says, here's the reason. You know, cling to God. Stay close to Him. Why? In verse 9, He's done these things. He's driven out these nations before you. Call these things to memory and be strengthened by it. He says in verse 10, One of your men puts to flight a thousand, for the Lord your God is he who fights for you just as he promised you. He says, your men, he puts, um, one of your men puts to flight a thousand. Those are unlikely odds. Those are odds that uh, uh, you know, we would not normally be able to stand against. And in the same way, the worldly way today is to prioritize perhaps wealth, to prioritize yourself over others, and this is in contrast to what Jesus taught to consider others before yourself. You know, the odds are kind of stacked against that as, as far as the way the world thinks. That's not the way to answer. That's not the way to be successful, to put yourself, uh, to put others before yourself. That's not going to work. 
And so it's seemingly odds, seemingly the odds are stacked against you, but the point he's making here is no matter how, you know, how unlikely the odds are, God is with you, and with him anything is possible. In verse 11, he says, so take diligent heed to yourselves to love the Lord your God. Be diligent, he says. This isn't going to happen by accident. This is a purposed and deliberate exercise that you have to engage yourself in. To remember, to remember, basically. And isn't it ironic that God, knowing you and me, His creation better than anyone else, prescribed a weekly reminder? To remember. God knows what is going to anchor our faith. It's the same thing that did it for Joshua. To remember what He had done for them. And for us, it is worthwhile to spend time and time, to to spend a moment every week, the bread and the cup, to remember Jesus and what he did for us, our ultimate sacrifice. It's important to to call these things to mind. He's going to finish up in verse 14 and uh, through 16 of chapter 23. I want you to notice where he finishes. He's getting ready to conclude his speech. Notice where he finishes. Again, another call to remember. In verse 14, he says, Now behold, today I'm going the way of all the earth, and you know in all your hearts and in all your souls that not one word of all the good words which the Lord your God spoke concerning you has failed. All have been fulfilled for you. Not one of them has failed. Don't forget this, Israel. Doesn't it seem like he might be harping on something and the people might be sitting there rolling their eyes? You just told us this. But for Joshua, it was enough to constantly revisit this idea. God made a promise and He's delivered on it. Camp out there for a minute and dwell on that. Meditate on that. Joshua is saying, we have a blessing that we have 20-20 hindsight. You know, the promise was made to Jacob and he didn't get to live that out. He was displaced to Egypt, Jacob was. But his, you know, he made a promise concerning his sons And that demonstrated Jacob's faith, and that was recalled in the Hall of Faith chapter in Hebrews chapter 11. The same thing for Joseph, right? Joseph told his family, take my bones with you to Egypt, or to the promised land, even though they were in in Egypt. That uh, demonstrated a great faith, right? Because he wasn't going to live physically but when the time that his the promise was fulfilled when the people were brought to the promised land but jo- what Joshua was saying is our hindsight is 2020 we can look back and see we we see now the fulfillment of the promise and you realize now even more so for us our hindsight our vision is even better than Joshua's because the prophets were presented with a mystery Paul tells us right the mystery was that the gospel was for everyone all people could be reconciled to God and grafted in. That's the mystery. And you and I have that blessing. We have the entirety of the Bible. And we see the beautiful story that it tells from end to end. It's all connected, every bit of it. And not everyone had that. Okay? So the point here is, it's a blessing to have all of these things here. And uh, it's, it's worthwhile to revisit those things constantly remember. That's a tool. It was a tool for Joshua. And it is for us. All right, let's look now at chapter 24. Another end of life speech. In in verse 1 it says, Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and their judges and their officers, and they presented themselves before God. So he's got all the people gathered again. Again, leaders and the common people. What's he going to start with in verse 2? Notice, again, he starts his speech with a call to remember. In verse 2 he says, Joshua said to all the people, Thus said the Lord, the God of Israel, from ancient times, I'm going to go back in history as I finally address you. From ancient times, your fathers lived beyond the river, namely Terah, the father of Abraham and the father of Nahor. They served other gods. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and multiplied his descendants and gave him Isaac. To Isaac, I gave Jacob and Esau and to Esau, I gave Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his sons went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt by what I did in its midst, and afterward I brought you out. You see, he's recounting history. He could have just said, he could have just skipped to what we're all familiar with, verse 14 and 15. Serve the Lord your God in sincerity and truth without not saying anything prior. But he finds it worthwhile to start with recounting the history. Remember this, and now my point will be clear. He continues in verse 6. I brought your fathers out of Egypt. 
And you came to the sea in Egypt, pursued your fathers with chariots and horsemen to the Red Sea. But when they cried out to the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your own eyes saw what I did in Egypt. And you lived in the wilderness for a long time. Then I brought you into the land of the Amorites who lived beyond the Jordan. They fought with you and I gave them into your hand. And you took possession of their land when I destroyed them before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. And he sent and summoned Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I was not willing to listen to Balaam. So he had to bless you and I delivered you from his hand. You crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho, and the citizens of Jericho fought against you. And the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Girgashite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, thus I gave them into your hand. I sent the hornet before you and drove out the two kings of the Amorites from before you, but not by your own sword. He calls them to remember. Remember the promise that I made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember that you were brought out of Egypt. Remember the plagues that were done in Egypt. The victory that you experienced over the Egyptians despite their technological superiority. He points to the chariot, chariots that they had. Despite that, you were victorious against them. Remember the wilderness wanderings. He points specifically to Balaam. You know, Remember that Balaam cursed you despite his repeated attempts uh, to, to cur- he blessed you despite his repeated attempts to curse you at the re- uh, request of King Balak. You saw the miracle when you crossed the Jordan. You, had ex- you, vic- you experienced victory over Jericho and all the other nations. And all of these things had nothing to do with your physical might, but only your faithful obedience to God's instruction. Verse 13 is another reminder. Take note. I gave you land on which you had not labored, cities which you had not built. You've lived in them. You're eating of vineyards and of olive groves which you did not plant. Remember, this is not of your own doing. And so now because of all this, he starts there and he says, now because of all this, verse 14, therefore, fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth. Put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. For Joshua, there's one logical conclusion, one natural thing to conclude that follows from what he has demonstrated in reviewing the history. And that is, serve the Lord in sincerity and truth. It reminds you of the conclusion of the preacher, the writer of Ecclesiastes, perhaps Solomon. At the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep His commandments. This is the whole duty of man. Ecclesiastes 12.13. And then he presents them with the choice. The dichotomous choice. Same one that we too have to deal with. Verse 15 If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today who you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. For Joshua, it was that simple. It was God or something else. And Joshua had made up his mind, and we've seen the resources, the tools that he utilized to encourage him in that. He constantly called these things to memory and You know, this resource is here for us as well. There's probably several resources that we could identify if we spent more time here, but I think this one is hard to miss, right? In in his two end-of-life speeches, Joshua constantly recounted, uh, recalled these things. He frequently remembered what God had done. Be faithful because God is faithful. That's the summary of what Joshua had to say. We're given similar instruction by the the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10, 23, let us hold fast then the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You know, I, ho- I hope this hasn't been too redundant, but sometimes redundancy gets the point across pretty clearly. We just have to be patient and, and let it have its effect and drill into our minds. And hopefully we can recall those things to memory and stay there and let it strengthen us as it clearly did Joshua. As we finish up this morning, I want to consider one final thing, what I find to be a life-changing influence on Joshua. A life-changing experience. You know, for Joshua, clearly, at the end of his book here, everything boiled down to this choice for Joshua. Who do you serve? And so to understand this mindset, I want to consider, finally, the scene at the end of Joshua chapter 5. You can flip back to Joshua. One way to divide the book of Joshua is chapters 1 through 5 is preparation for conquest. 
And then chapter 6 and everything after is the conquest itself. And if you've read through Joshua sort of at a high level, if you imagine it being a movie, the climax of the book happens right at this transition. Everything leading up to the conquest happens in chapters 1 through 5, and it's sort of this dramatic preparation. I want you to imagine that you're Joshua for a second. Right? Your mentor was Moses. You've seen all the things that you've seen, and on the night, perhaps, before going into Jericho, what would you be thinking about? Well, we've already seen when Joshua finally had an attentive audience, he recounted the history. I am certain that leading up to that grand moment, I mean, how awesome would that be? How awesome would it be to begin the conquest? We are here and it's happening now. And Joshua's the leader. What would he be? Th- I'm sure he recounted the promise that God made in Genesis 12 to Abraham and then to Isaac in Genesis 26 and the dream that Jacob had in Genesis 28. The final words of Jacob and of Joseph, which we talked about before. Uh, Joshua himself was born a slave into Egypt. He witnessed the things that the plagues. And God said, God said when he told Moses, you will know who I am. What's your name? I am who I am. It will be very clear who this God is. I will demonstrate myself in the plagues. And did he not? And Joshua was a witness of those things. The wilderness wanderings. Joshua saw, I'm certain that he called those things to memory. So you keep that in your mind. Then you understand in the first uh, five books of Joshua as they, as they prepare. Imagine you're watching this movie. In chapter 1, God speaks directly to Joshua and affirms his leadership position. In chapter 2, they have that successful espionage mission, right, with the help of Rahab. At the beginning of chapter 3, they consecrate the people as they're preparing to cross the Jordan. They're finally here. It's happening. And then in a miraculous display from God's handiwork, they cross the Jordan. In chapter 4, they set up a memorial to remember that crossing because it was so awesome. They're here. They're in the promised land. In chapter 5, the first part, they circumcise themselves. In chapter uh, 5, after that, they celebrate the Passover. I find this to be awesome and magnificent, right? Like God led them out of Egypt, and here they are in the promised land celebrating their exodus from Egypt. What do you think they were talking about around the table that night at Passover? Jericho's about to happen. We are, they must have been confident in themselves having this this 2020 hindsight, right? And then the climax of it all. Right before, you know, whenever I read this at the very end of chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, I like to think that it was the night before Jericho. I don't know that it was. But I, I, you know, for, I guess, drama. I like to imagine that. And I sort of envision this happening kind of like a movie. So when you see what happens here in Joshua chapter 5, verse 13, it says, It came about when Joshua was by Jericho, almost like he's scoping it out the night before. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? Now pause there. What we're going to find out is this man was the captain of the Lord's army, or the captain of the Lord's host, it says. It was a representative of God. And you see the question that Joshua asks him. Are you for us or for against us? Given everything that we've developed here, as an audience, as a person watching this movie, reading this account, what do you expect? What do you expect him to, you expect him to say, yes, I'm with you. I'm on your side. Take the land. God is with you. Right? That's what we expect. The irony is his answer in verse 14. He said no. Rather, I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What has my Lord to say to his servant? He he goes on to tell him to remove his sandals. The place he's standing is holy. Now you think about these last three verses. Like, What's the point in this? How am I supposed to interpret that? And people have many different ways to interpret this little account. Some people think it was just to elevate Joshua to put him on a level playing field with Moses by giving him this holy ground, remove your sandals type event, like what Moses had in Exodus 3. Um, But an interpretation that I find to be more instructive is he says no, as if to say, Joshua, wrong question. I'm a representative for God. 
The question is not for God. God, whose side are you on? Are you with us? God is the side. The question is for you, Joshua. Who do you serve? Are you conv- you, you've got this conquest coming up ahead of you, and you want to be successful in this? Are you convicted in what you believe, Joshua? That's all that matters. Whose side are you on? Is your mind made up about who you follow? Who do you choose, Joshua? That's the question. The the point is, God will be victorious in this, with or without you, Joshua. Whose side are you on? And we're presented with a similar choice today. Now, tomorrow we may not go and conquest lands in in a militant fashion, but in, in a real sense, we are in spiritual warfare. The Bible talks about this, the conquest of our life, if you will, in the battles that we deal with, and God will be victorious. Cling to Him. Be on His side. The question is for you, have you chosen God? Have you chosen Jesus as your Savior? If you haven't, the answer that you're giving is no. If you haven't committed yourself to Him. And are you sitting there saying, yes, I've chosen Jesus? That means that you've committed your life to Him You've put to death the old way of sin, your former way of life, the former way you used to think in baptism by being baptized into His death and being resurrected a new person so that we can legitimately consider ourselves dead to sin but alive to God, Paul says in Romans 6.11. You have that opportunity now. I want to encourage you to choose God. If we can help you in any way this morning, won't you come forward as we stand and sing.